بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. Continuing with our journey through the book Umdu al Fiqh, the chapters pertaining to Tahara. طيب moving on now to the Imam, he's going to talk about najasat. He's going to talk about impurities and how to deal with different categories of impurities. First and foremost, lughatan. What is impurity? Impurity, they say, lughatan is al qadara. Al qadara, something which is filthy. Something which is dirty. Okay? Istilahan, technically, what a najasa is, what an impurity is, is Aynun Mustahbathatun fi shara. Something, something physical, which is considered filthy by the sharia. This is the meaning istilahan. What does the word istilahan mean? We, we mentioned this last week and the week before. What do I mean when I say istilahan? The technical meaning, okay? The technical defin- definition. So, أَيْنُ الْمُسْتَخْبَثَةٌ فِي الشَّرْ Anything which is uh, considered or decreed as being impure and dirty by the sharia, by the textual, textual evidence. Why is this important? Somebody comes across, for whatever reason, camel urine. And he says, that's impure. There's no way. This is urine. For sure, urine is impure. But we'll say to him, no, you're wrong. In the sharia, it's not impure. It might be filthy, considered amongst the people is something filthy, right? Urine of a camel. But technically in the Sharia, it's not considered as being filthy. That's why this definition reminds us that what we are talking about is what is designated as being impure in the revelation, not in the minds of the people. So the first of them, he's going to talk about a category which is known as Mughalladha. Okay, Najasatun Mughalladhatun. Mughalladha means that which is severe in its category, categorization. Okay, that which is severe in its categorization. So the Imam he says, وَتُغْسَلُ النَّجَاسُتُ الْكَبُّ الْخَنْزِيرِ سَبْعًا إِحْدَهُنَّ بِتُرَاب So he says that the najasa of the dog and the pig is washed seven times. One of those times using soil. And this is based upon the hadith in Bukhari where the Prophet ﷺ said, إِذَا وَلَقَ الْكَلْبُ فِي إِنَاءِ أَحَدِكُمْ فَلْيَغْسِلْهُ سَبْعًا If the dog licks into the vessel that one of you have, then wash that vessel seven times. So you can see it's a severe type of najasa, the licking of the dog, right? In another narration in Sahih Muslim, the Prophet ﷺ said, Ula biturab. The first of those wash- washings should be with soil. Okay? So seven washings and the first of them should be with soil. Why do you think we have to wash with soil when the dog licks into a vessel? Because because it's revelation, first and foremost, at the end of the day. Secondly, scientists, they confirm for us with all their technology that they have, that the microbes that come from the saliva of the dog is something which is very severe and potent with regards to the harm that it has for the immune system of the human being, okay? The viruses and the microbes contained in that saliva are very severe. And in fact, they are not killed, they are not removed by anything more better than soil. When you use soil to remove those microbes, as the Prophet ﷺ told us to do so, then you find that those microbes are fully removed. So the ulama, they say that you have to use soil when it comes to the saliva of the dog to remove that effect of the najasa. Najasatun mughalladatun, the severe najasa. And um, the Hanabila scholars, the Hanbali scholars, from whom our imam is from amongst them, though he differs with them, the majority of them, they say that لا يشترط التراب That it's not conditional for you to use soil. Now this is good news if you want to follow that opinion. Because if a dog was to jump on you and he was to lick you all over your face, then you have a problem now. Are you going to wash your face using dirt, etc.? So it would make a bit of difficulty upon you, right? And the sharia is based upon raf al haraj raising and removing of difficulty. So maybe that opinion in the Hanbali Madhab is a good opinion, that the Soil is not conditional for you to remove the najasa of the dog. In any case, our Imam, what did he say? How to remove the najasa of the dog? The saliva? Tell me. What did he say? How many times do we wash? Seven times. And one of them has to be with soil. Taib. And also, if you look, he added to that, he said also the pig, the najasa of the pig is also mughalladha. Mughalladha, severe najasa. Okay, which requires this type of treatment. They say that the pig is akhbath min al-kalb, that the pig is more dirty than the dog, right? So in any case, 
the, um, the ulama, they add this to this category, like our Imam Ibn Qadam al-Maqtasi rahimahullah ta'ala, because they say it's akhbat, it's more filthy. The pig, the way it lives, the way it behaves, its habitat is more filthy than that of the dog, okay? So they say, min babil awla, babil awla, when the fuqaha, they use it, they mean the ruling is more so. Babil awla, okay? So min babil awla, the ruling is more so for the pig than it is for the dog, because it's more filthy. But the majority of the ulama, they say no. The majority of, so our Imam, he puts the pig in the category of the dog, seven washes, right? One of them being with Turab. The majority of the ulama, they say no. Why? Because there's a narration in, uh, collected by Imam Hakim, Imam Al Hakim, in his Mustadrak, where Abi Tha'la Al Khushani, radiyallahu anhu, he said, I asked the Prophet, وسلم, and I said, Ya Rasulullah, inna bi ardi ahli kitab. We at times are in the lands of the Christians and the Jews. And Yashrabun al Khamur wa Ya'kulun al Khanzir. They drink alcohol and they eat pig. They eat the pig. So what do you think about their vessels? Are we allowed to use them? He said, Da'uha ma wajadtum anhabud. He said, Leave them alone as long as you can find a replacement for those vessels. But if you do not find a replacement for these vessels, then wash them with water. Wash the vessels with water. So now looking at this hadith of Abi Thalib al Khushani, what is the waj al dalala here? Waj al dalala. Waj al dalala means what is the point of evidence taken from the hadith? So when you say waj al dalala, it means the point of evidence extracted from the hadith to prove your point. So the point the majority make, they say there's no need for seven washings for the pig. So after quoting this hadith, what is the waj al dalala in this hadith? That there's no need for seven washings according to the majority. He said, wash without mentioning an adid, without mentioning a number of washings. The Prophet ﷺ said, just wash, wash the vessels. And this is what the majority of the ulama, they say. They say, you wash the vessel until the ether of the najasa goes. Whether that's one washing, whether it's seven washing, whether it's ten washings. Okay, so the asal is that one washing suffices, but if you need more, you go to more. So this is the difference in the opinions. But I want you to remember the opinion of the Imam, the author, whose book we are taking. The extra information, what do you do with it? If you can remember it and understand it, then well and good. If not, then move on. The Imam now, he's going to speak about another category. So the first category, najasatun mughalladatun, severe najasa, okay? Which requires how many washings last time? Seven times, right? And one of them being with soil. So now he's going to talk about the second category, which is the middle level of severity of impurity. So the Imam, he says, And it suffices in other than the pig and the dog, okay? Three washings, munqiyah. Munqiyah means that it leaves the thing clean and pure, okay? So suffices three washings, our Imam is saying. So the first thing he mentioned to us, that severe najasa of the dog and the pig, he told us seven washings, once with Turab. Now he's moved on now to the middle level of washing, middle level of najasa. And he said, suffices in these najasat, three, three washings, okay? Which will leave the thing pure, munqiyah. What is this based upon? The Prophet Sallallahu said in the hadith in Mutafiq uh, al Mutafiq al means it's collected by Imam Bukhari and Imam Muslim. He said in the hadith, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when you hear the name of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it's good to say Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He said, إِذَا اسْتَيْقَدَ أَحَدُكُمْ مِنْ نَوْمِهِ فَلَا يَغْمِسْ يَدَهُ فِي الْإِنَاءِ حَتَّى يَغْسِلَهَا ثَلَاثِ فَإِنَّ أَحَدُكُمْ لَا يَدْرِ أَيْنَ بَاتَتْ يَدَهُ The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, if one of you gets up from sleep, then he shouldn't put his hand into the vessel meaning the vessel where he's going to make wudu, unless he washes his hand three times, because verily one of you doesn't know where his hand has been in the night. So this implies that the Prophet ﷺ is saying that maybe your hand fell upon najasa when you were sleeping and you don't know, right? So the ulama, they say, look, in this hadith, the Prophet ﷺ is saying, due to a waham, due to a supposition, is there an easier word than supposition? Due to a possibility, that your hand fell on najasa, the Prophet's telling you, don't put your hand into the water because that will make the water impure. So they say, what about you come a case when you come across a case when for sure you have najasa on your clothing or something? So in this case, you must wash three times. 
So to make it simple, this hadith is telling us that you should wash najasa three times apart from the najasa of the pig and the dog, okay? Pig and dog seven, these other najasat, the Prophet said three times, okay? The majority, they say no. The majority, they say, one time suffices, not only based upon the previous hadith that we mentioned, but also based upon the hadith with the Prophet Sallallahu from his mercy, a Arabi came to the masjid, a Bedouin Arab came to the masjid, urinated. And we know the story which shows the beautiful mercy of the Prophet Sallallahu where the people, they gathered around him and they were making life difficult for the, for the Bedouin. They wanted to beat him up for urinating in the masjid like most of us would do. But the Prophet Sallallahu Rahmatullah mercy to the humanity and all of mankind, he said, leave him alone. Because he wanted to let him finish without disturbing him. And imagine had the people gathered around him and tried to intervene, what would have happened? The najasa would have went everywhere, on everybody. So the Prophet ﷺ, not only from wisdom and mercy, not only from mercy, but also from wisdom. In any case, the Prophet ﷺ said, Subbu ala bawl al-a'rabi dhunuban min ma." Go and get, fetch a pail or a bucket of water and throw that upon where the Bedouin urinated. So they say, see here, the Prophet ﷺ only made one throwing of water sufficing to remove the urine. So they say this is a proof that one washing suffices and if you need more, you go more than one washing, okay? So what did our Imam say? Our Imam said in the second category of najasatun mutawasitatun. He said three washings, right? And the majority, they say one washing. Let's move on. The Imam, he says, فَإِنْ كَانَتْ عَلَى الْأَرْضِ فَصَبَّةٌ وَاحِدَةٌ تَذْهَبُ عَيْنِهَا he says, the Imam, if the najasa is upon the ground, okay, then one washing suffices that. Due to the statement of the Prophet ﷺ, which I just mentioned, pertaining to the Bedouin. So based upon that hadith, the Imam says, any najasa on the ground, one washing suffices as a minimum. Okay, if you need more, you go to more. طيب. But what do you do before you have to, or what do you do before you wash the najasa on the ground sometimes there's something you need to do Asanta, you need to remove it right because if you put water on it it will spread further depending upon what type of najasa it is so you have to remove the actual physical entity of the impurity first and then you throw water over it meaning if it was a solid type of najasa which could sp uh, spread Tayyib. So our Imam, notice, he differentiates, differentiates between najasa, which is on the ground, or on other places. Other places, he went from seven to three, but if it's on the ground, only one, okay? Got it? So our Imam, he differentiates where the najasa is. If it's on the ground, one suffices. And if you need more, you can move to have more. Now we're going to go to the third category, which is mukhaffafa. Okay, so we had Mughalladha, Siveh, Mutawasita, Middle, Mukhaffafa, which is uh, the light najasa, the easy najasa, okay, which doesn't require too much. So the Imam, he says, وَيُجْزِئُ فِي بَوْلِ الْغُلَامِ الَّذِي لَمْ يَأْكُلُ الطَّعَامِ النَّضْحِ The Prophet Sallallahu said, it suffices, uh, sorry, the Imam, he said, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, it suffices with regards to the impurity of a toddler, a male toddler, a boy, a young boy, that doesn't eat food, nadh, that you make nadh. Nadh is that you get a handful of water and you sprinkle it where the najasa is. Okay? That is nadh. You get a handful of water, you sprinkle it, you throw it where the najasa is. There's no need for washing, there's no need for rubbing. Okay? So first, the Imam, he said, وَيُدْزِئُ فِي بَوْلُ الْغِلَامِ it suffices in the urine of a baby boy. Okay, so not for the girl, for the boy. This is the first qaid, the first restriction. The second, الَّذِي لَمْ يَأْقُلَ الطَّعَامِ He doesn't eat food, this boy. Okay, he's not desiring to eat food. He's not screaming for food. He's still on the milk of his mother or on bottled milk. Okay, and in this situation, you make nadh. What is this based upon? It's based upon the hadith in Bukhari, where it's narrated that Umm Qais bint Mahsin رضي الله عنها أتت بابن لها صغير لم يأكل الطعام إلى النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم 
that this woman, Umm Qais bint Muhsin, she came to the Prophet ﷺ with a small boy of hers that didn't eat food, meaning lam yashtahi ta'am. It didn't, his, this toddler wouldn't scream for food. It wouldn't see food and want to partake in the food. So as a young age, we hadn't started eating food. فأجلسه رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم في هجره فبال على ثوبه فداء رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم بماء فنضحه ولم يغسله. So this toddler was sitting on the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم and it urinated. So the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم didn't do what we do, throw away the child, right? The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم just called with his mercy, bring some water. Water was brought to him. The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم put it in his palm, threw water on the place where the urine was, and that was the end of the story. So the hadith is showing what the Imam is saying that urine from a boy that is young, a baby, that doesn't eat food, then this urine is najasa, mukhaffafa, light najasa. All you need to do is make nadh. Nadh, we said, you get the water, you throw it on the affected area. Tayyib. Now, a lot of the ulama, they discuss why is this for the boy and not for the girl. Like we said, at the end of the day, if we know it's authentically reported from the Prophet Sallallahu some an wa ta'an, we say we hear and we obey, whether we understand or we don't understand. But many of the ulama, they discuss what is the illa for this? What is the illa? What's this word illa? We've mentioned it a few times before. Illa, I said, the cause for the ruling. Okay? Al-hukm yaduru ma'a illatihi wujudan wa adman. Every ruling revolves around the illa, the cause for the ruling, whether it's present or not present. Meaning that if this cause is present, then the ruling will be present. If this cause is not present, then the hukm, the ruling, will not be present, be removed. So what is the illa with regards to the urine of a baby boy being easy najasa, being the least of the najasa? Najasa al A lot of the ulama, they say, first and foremost, the illa here is the abudi. The abudi mean that we don't really know the reason for it, so we just accept it and we submit to it. Okay? Like, for example, somebody would say to you, why do you make tawaf around the Kaaba seven times instead of six times, instead of eight times? We don't know. There's no scientific reason for it. We say this is ta'abudi, this is obedience to Allah Azza wa Jal. That we don't claim to understand everything Allah tells us. How can we put our intelligence on the same intelligence of Allah Azza wa Jal? We don't even understand each other many a time. How are we going to understand every single thing that Allah demands from us? So at times, we have to do what Islam wants us to do, which is istislam, submission. That is the true worship to Allah Azza wa Jal. So some of them, they say that is, this is ta'abudi. The illa is ta'abudi. Allahs, they say, it is takhfif. It's ease. What they mean by this, they mean that in general, in societies, you find that the boy is picked up, the baby boy is picked up more than the girl. So this would cause a balwa, this would cause a difficulty if the baby boy, you had to wash the urine like you had to wash off the girl. So this is what they say, okay? That it's either ta'abudi or it's either takhfif. In any case, did we understand how to wash it? You just get a, uh, a bit of water in your hand, you make nadh. You, you just throw the water, sprinkle the water onto the impurity. The Imam, he says, وَكَذَلِكَ الْمَذِي And also takes this ruling, the Imam is saying, الْمَذِي الْمَذِي مَعُنْ رَخِيكَ this madhi is a fluid which comes out from the private part and it generally comes about, it's sticky, and it generally comes about due to um, desires taking place at the beginning of desire. When a person starts to think about desire, when he's newly married, he's thinking about the time he's going to spend with his wife, etc. You will find that this person, he has madhi. Sometimes it comes out due to an illness, okay? And it's sticky. It comes out from the private part. The imam, he says this, also takes the same ruling as the urine of the baby boy. What's the ruling? Nadah. Nadah. You take a bit of water, you sprinkle the water. No need to do more than that, right? Why? Because the Prophet ﷺ was asked about it in the hadith in Sahih Muslim. He said, Tawadda. He said, make wudu and then do the sprinkling upon your private parts. Okay? In fact, the other way around. Do the sprinkling upon your private parts and then make wudu. Okay? This is what the Prophet ﷺ said to do in this situation. So therefore, madhi is given the same ruling as that of the baby boy's urine. It's the easy najasa. It's dealt with in a very easy way. The Imam, he says, وَيُعْفَ أَنْ يَسِيرِهِ وَيَسِيرِ الدَّمْ and overlooked is a little bit of this madhi. If it's a little bit of madhi, this uh, fluid that comes out from the private part, 
or a little bit of blood, and then it's overlooked, meaning you don't have to do anything with it, right? You just carry on, happy, go, lucky, carry on the day, no need to make wudu, no need to sprinkle water in it. Why? Because in the hadith in Tirmidhi, Sahil ibn Hunayf radiallahu anhu, he said, I used to suffer from this madhi often. It used to come out a lot. So I used to make a ghusl. And I came to the Prophet sallallahu and I asked the Prophet sallallahu about this. He said, it suffices you to make wudu. No need for you to make a ghusl. Then he said, what about the stuff or, or the part that gets onto my clothes? Onto my clothing. The Prophet sallallahu said, in this case, to make nadh, just to throw water onto it. Okay. So the ulama, they say, look, when you look at the hadith, we understand that madhi is najis. It's impure. But if it comes onto the clothing and all you've done is you've got a bit of water and you've thrown water onto it, there may still be traces of madhi left because you didn't do any rubbing. So they say from this we understand that this is ma'fu and an, that this is overlooked. Because had it not been overlooked, the Prophet ﷺ, like in other situations pertaining to blood of the ha'id, blood of the menstruating woman, the Prophet ﷺ said that you have to rub it. So the hadith is telling us that a little bit of madhi is overlooked, okay? If it comes out or if it falls onto the clothes. So in any case, the Imam, he says, a little bit of madhi is overlooked, as well as a little bit of blood, okay? As a little bit of blood. I just want to remind you with something, brothers. When we study fiqh at this level, as beginners, we're not really supposed to, it's not required from us to memorize the evidences, the adillah. I'm giving you these dalils to help you if you want to memorize them or if you want to try to understand how the Imam came to his opinion. Because it's like if I go and study a science of some sort. In the beginning year of science, what are you told? You're just told facts. You're just told to understand the facts. And then in the second year, more information is given to you. And you start to understand how the scientists, which methodologies they use to bring about these facts. And it goes deeper and deeper. The same with fiqh. It's impossible for me and you at an early stage to understand what the ulama are really talking about. How did they extrapolate everything? The most important thing to understand is to conceptualize what the imam is talking about. Okay? That's the most important thing. So don't be worried if sometimes you get lost in the information. But I'm sure if you go back to the video and you study it properly, you'll be able to understand. So the imam, he said that a little bit of madhi and blood is overlooked. What is the proof of blood being overlooked? In the hadith, the Prophet ﷺ, in Bukhari, Aisha radiyallahu anha, she said, the, our mother, Aisha, Umm al-Mu'mineen, she said, Ma kana li ihdana illa thawbun wahid tahidu fihi. Some of us, the women of the time of the companions, we never used to have except for one piece of clothing. And we would menstruate in that one piece of clothing. فَإِنْ أَصَابُهُ شَيْءٌ مِّنْ دَمْ قَالَتْ بِرِيقِهَا ثُمَّ قَسَعَتْهُ بِذُفْرِهَا the Prophet uh, Aisha radiallahu anha, she said, in this piece of clothing that we would menstruate in, if at times menstruating blood would affect it, then what we used to do, we used to get our saliva, meaning it's only a little bit of blood. We would get our saliva and we would wash it off with the saliva and we would scratch it off the rest of it with our nails. So the ulama, they say, look, obviously there's going to be a trace of it left. So had it not been overlooked, then the Prophet would have told them or they would have known that we have to wash it. But for the fact that she just used saliva and she used her nail to scrub it, it means that a little bit of blood is overlooked. Okay? So the Imam, he said a little, a little bit of madhi and a little bit of blood is overlooked. Okay? The blood which is not overlooked is the blood which is flowing. The Imam, he says, وَمَا تَوَلَّدَ مِنْهُ مِنَ الْقَيْحِ وَنَحْوِهِ And also adding to this category which is overlooked of madhi and a little bit of blood, is that which comes about from the blood, like pus. Pus and there's something else. But anyway, pus is one of them, okay? So here the Imam, he's saying that uh, pus as an impurity, if it comes out, then it takes the same ruling as madhi and as the blood, as the little bit of blood. Little bit of madhi, little bit of blood, overlooked. Also, a little bit of this pus which comes out is also overlooked, okay? And this is based on some of the statements from the companions, radiyallahu anhum. Now the Imam, he makes a statement. He says, All of what is mentioned, these three things, the madhi, which is overlooked, the blood, which is overlooked, the pus, which is overlooked, the dhabit for that, dhabit means the qualifying rule, the qualifying rule which determines what is overlooked is that which doesn't shock you. So when you look at the blood, you don't see it shocking. Yeah, it's nothing. It's just a little bit. Okay? It doesn't, wow, this is really bad. Okay, it's just a little bit. 
So this part, this amount, it's overlooked. And also the ulama, they said that this dhabit, it applies to a normal person. This qualifying rule is to a normal person because if you go to a butcher and you show him a huge amount of blood, there's nothing to him. He sees blood all day long, right? So it's, a, it's, it's what would shock the general person, not the abnormal person, not the butcher or somebody who loves watching these horror movies. You know, all day long he's watching horror movies. So when he sees blood, it's Adi. I love this blood, right? So it doesn't bother him in any way, shape or form. This person is excluded. The Imam, he says, He says that the money, the semen of the sons of Adam and the daughters of Adam is pure. And also the urine of those animals which are halal for you to eat is pure. So urine of animals is pure from those animals which you are allowed to eat as well as the semen is also pure. With regards to semen, they say, well, first and foremost, the money is your asal. It's your origin. It's where you came from. وَلَقَدْ كَرَمْنَا بَنِي آدم. And we have made Bani Adam honored. So if you are honored, and you, how can your asal, how can your, uh, your beginnings be something impure? This is one way of looking at it. The other way of looking at it, the, uh, the Aisha radiallahu anha, she said in the hadith narrated by Abi Dawood, كُنْتُ أَفْرَكُ الْمَنِي مِنْ ثَوْبِ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم فَيُصَلِّ فِيهِ I used to remove the money with my saliva and my nail from the thobe of the Prophet sallallahu and he would go ahead and pray in it. Uh, Aisha radiallahu anha, she said that I used to clean the semen from the clothing of the Prophet sallallahu just with a bit of saliva or just scraping it off from my... Um, for my nail. So the ulama, they said, had it been najis, it would have required a washing. It wouldn't have sufficed for her to just do that with the nail. And the reason the ulama in the books of fiqh, they recommend that you wash is so that you have good appearance. Nobody wants to pray next to somebody who has lots of marks over his stove, right? The washing is for good appearance so that when you come to the masjid, khudu zina to come in the kuli masjid. You take your adornment in every masjid. Taib, the last point with regards to what did I say? The urine of the animals, okay? The Prophet sallallahu as in Sahih Muslim, he was asked, uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Oh Prophet of Allah, can I pray in the stables of the sheep where the sheep are kept? Okay? Or the like thereof, sheep, goats, etc. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, Naam, yes, go ahead and pray there. Had it been impure, the Prophet would not have allowed the man to pray in an impure place because it would have affected his clothes. Allah, Allah uh, commands the Prophet Sallallahu to keep his clothing pure when he prays. Okay, and that's a command for us. We have to pray in pure clothing. So if we were to pray in a place where animal urine is impure, it would affect our clothing. Therefore, the hadith shows that animals which we eat, which are halal for us to eat, their urine and also their roth, also their feces is pure for us and it doesn't make uh, any impurity on us. Okay, but of course, you would wash it off for ease, etc. So this is what I have to say today, inshallah. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Anything which was correct was a gift from Allah azza wa jal. Any mistakes and shortcomings were from myself and shaitan. If you have any questions pertaining to the topic that we took, then feel free to ask.